So when we started like laying into how are we going to design and build not just network equipment, but systems, architectures overall, <clears throat> the first thing we had to ask ourselves is like, what do we actually care about? What matters to our clients? How do we, what principles do we want to apply to designing these systems? And the thing we found, uh, first and foremost, uh, every network ever built focuses in, rightly so, on reliability. Yet we've seen vendors and systems architects actually compromise network reliability when racing to have time to market or some new cool feature or some new capability. I mean, how many times have we seen product architectures coming forth that said, oh yeah, that, that fast failover thing, you don't really need that. This new system will work just fine. Right, so we have to think through these. We have to design systems that are actually designed to fail. And when Ken Duda talks about the architecture of EOS and how it applies to the problem space we're gonna to analyze today, think through that and keep that in the top of your mind. How is this OS architecture actually designed to die? We expect that at some point in its lifetime, processes will fail. An OS will fail. Hardware will fail. So we must design systems architectures around that. Anshul showed us a leaf spine design. We kind of like to start clients with four switch spines. And I had a couple customers go, why? Why four? Besides being a binary number, besides, you know, part of, you know, like it, it's round. What do we like about the, why not three? Or why not seven? Um, the answer for four was really obvious. If with four, I can have a change control event and take a switch out of service. While I'm doing that, I can have another switch crash, burn, and die. And I still have a network that has no single point of failure in it. That was the design constraint. Expect that things will fail. Assume things will get breached. We've seen this more and more in recent times that is the number of exploits is increasing dramatically. Design for automation, design for multi-vendor. You saw that in a very clear use case with the joint project with Facebook, but we see it with people adopting multi-cloud. <coughs> I think the right scale number was what, 84% of enterprises uh, polled are in four or more clouds. We see it with our own supply chains. We always try to have two vendors for every critical component. Our network should be the same way. And then observability, gathering data so we can answer the questions we don't know the answer. We, we can answer the questions that we don't even know we want to ask right now. This is the hard part of telemetry and observability. It's gather as much data as possible because we will have a question tomorrow about what happened today that we don't know is going to be asked. The more data we gather, the easier it is to interrogate that data and get to those answers. Where people like to talk a lot about AI and ML and the ongoing joke is if it's ML, it's probably Python. If it's AL, it's probably written in PowerPoint. But that being said, machine learning takes perfect data. The more perfect data you can input into that system, the better results you'll get out. So designing network systems around the concept of observability, of getting as much data, storing it, retaining it, synthesizing it, making it useful, and having a culture of explicability, not just the black, spot, the black box spit the answer out, but this is why that happened is incredibly important to network operators. Now, we learned a lesson over the past couple years, and it started with a question we liked to ask customers. What unit of measure do you use to describe a network upgrade, the frequency of network upgrade for a core data center switch? So let me just, I, I, I know Carl, I think we joked about this right before. Um, like what unit of measure would you use to describe the frequency of data center switch upgrades in networks you've seen? Uh, you know, whenever you replace the, the switch the next time. That's like a five to seven year life cycle. Yeah. Is that common across the board? Years? Years, what we're saying? <laughs> Why? I think a lot of companies look at it as they say that's the infrastructure, it's working, don't touch it. Infrastructure, it works, don't touch it. Okay. Now, the thing we found is the more advanced the operating model of an enterprise is, the more confident they are in how their systems work and how they command those systems, the more capable they are of upgrading at an increased frequency. And the lesson, when I say we learned something, it was that we approached network automation from a concept at one point of, ports should have profiles and I should be able to make a change and it should push that port profile to thousands of devices instantly. 
And it's kind of awesome, like I should, right? I have thousands of like configured ports. And then the Spider-Man, like is it Uncle Ben or Uncle Owen comes in, you know, with incredible power, comes incredible responsibility. What are you thinking? What if you, if I typed reload power now and had it execute on a thousand boxes at once, that's probably not smart. That would be a bad decision. And so we realized that we need to approach network operational maturity from a perspective of what should you do first, like read-only automation. Like, can I automate in a way that is really low risk and not likely to destroy my network? Could I just back my configurations up every night? Maybe diff them when they were upgraded? Or could I dump to a spreadsheet all the ports to domain names, to IP addresses, to Macs and Google Sheets so I could search it automatically? Or how often do we hate that phone call? The network is slow today. I know what runbook I would execute when I get that call. I'm going to look for configuration changes. I'm going to do a ping and a trace route. I'm going to look for packet drops and counter increments. Well, why don't I do that automatically and attach it to the trouble ticket? Everything we just described requires nothing more than a show command or maybe a ping and trace route. These are the types of automations that can move somebody forward on this journey, getting comfortable with network automation without having to take a leap of faith into the unknown. When most network engineers I know look like me, we're not in our 20s. I'm, I was not born and raised on Python and Golang. I'm a little afraid. And we see that again and again. So providing a practical path to adopt automation and design an operational maturity model to move forward to cooler and cooler capabilities gives a path. But it does very often directly correlate with how quickly you could upgrade. Now, when you tell me I upgrade once every couple years, I think back to what happened around 1999, which was we started using the Linux-based operating system in networking for our base OS for most network operating systems. Uh, one company primarily uses BSD. Most others use Linux. Now, Linux is an awesome OS. There was a tremendous benefit to us as the vendor in using Linux. I got to use somebody else's SSH code, and I didn't have to write it. I got to use somebody else's SNMP, somebody else's you know, TCP stack, and I didn't have to write it. Now, the benefit was absolute time to market was great. The negative was the technical sophistication required to execute an exploit became much lower. I can post on Reddit while we're sitting here, what, hey, I just owned a system and gained root, what can I do? And I will get a ton of awesome responses of amazingly creative things that could be done if I owned root on a system. I could load a reverse shell that called home. I could disable certain log messages from ever appearing. I could put a hypervisor in if I wanted. I could load my own code and execute it. I could do all sorts of fun things. Now, in reality, open source has improved the actual security of a system. The eye of Sauron of security researchers inspecting source code and looking for problems and publishing them has actually resulted in far more secure systems than we've ever had before. But at a cost, which is in publishing that attack vector, how to execute it, the source code to validate how to use that and make sure a system has been patched, there is an increased risk. The attack surface is broader than ever before. And the threat landscape is greater than ever before because the complexity and technical sophistication to execute an attack is lower than ever before. Now, the government has been kind enough to classify these as vulnerabilities or exploits, slightly different, but there's a commonality between them. A vulnerability is a, quote, mistake in software code, what we might call a bug, that provides an attacker with access to a system. And exposure is, a mistake in software code that gives an attacker indirect access to a system or network. These are defects. These are bugs that somebody wrote. Sometimes we wrote them. Sometimes they came in from the software bill of materials that we used, and we are responsible for them regardless. And there's been a lot of them, and they're getting worse every year. I think it's about a 16.6% compound annual growth rate. If this was an investment asset, put your money there. It's just getting worse every year. There's more and more defects coming. And the severity of them, broken down by vendor by OS over the last five years, 
is a lot of them fall into the critical and high category. Now, why am I saying this? It's not to throw a stone at one vendor versus another for them having more bugs or less bugs and more software vulnerabilities and less software vulnerabilities, although that is fun to do sometimes. It's that with a large number of critical and high severity vulnerabilities, we have to ask ourselves a very fundamental question. And this question actually pains me as somebody who spent the last 20 years in this industry doing network operating systems. And my very first conversation I ever had with Ken Duda was, can we change the way switches upgrade? Because they upgrade wrong. They boot wrong. They shut down wrong. We haven't done a great job as an industry in making it easy. And because of that, I have to ask the following question. When Carl tells me that we're only upgrading every couple years, and I know that a 13-year-old can look on a website and download source code and execute an attack against a Linux system that runs in the core of your network from any infected host that is directly connected to it on any port and take it over, and I'm just about willing to guarantee that every one of you has a firewall or security system that depends on the sanctity of VLANs being unhoppable from one to the next, yet I can take over that switch, gain root, but put VLANs wherever I want, bypass every single security control you've implemented in your network with open attacks that are published publicly with source code that's available. What I hear is this. We failed you. We've made, for some reason, you're more afraid of upgrading a switch from our software to our software. That is a scarier, riskier activity for you than that external threat actor using a well-known attack vector to take over your core systems and bypass every security control you depend on. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. That's the core of this conversation. And so when you saw this long list of cast of characters that we want to bring up, and when I'm followed by Jeff Raymond and Ken Duda, I, I think I can appropriately use the term cast of characters. I wanted to have our team answer the following question. Not just why is your code worse than their code and all of that, but instead look at it differently and say, how can we as an industry do better for you? How can we take what Anshul put up there, an amazing operator experience, and actually deliver it for something that with your actions, you tell us you are more afraid of an upgrade than of all of these bad things that are happening in the industry and the front page news of this hacker attack and that one? How do we make upgrades not suck is what we could probably summarize this session as. And it starts with a couple things. How do we improve software quality, not just to reduce vulnerabilities, but the worst thing you ever experience? I upgraded from version four to version five because of a multicast defect. And then you come in with a CVE and the CISO says, I have to upgrade to dot seven. So I go to version seven and it reintroduced the bug from version four. That's probably why most people don't upgrade. Regression isn't very good. How do we fix that? How do we automate awareness of these, of these risks? How do we let you know when there's a CVE, when there's a vulnerability, when there's a security advisory, when there's a SEV1 defect? What are the devices that are taking risk in your environment? Where are you accepting that risk or versus where are you managing it? We want to let you know that. How do we simplify and automate remediation? How do we execute that upgrade in a non-disruptive a way as possible so that you can actually say, you know what? Yeah, that's CVE, oh, that's bad. I'd like to remediate that in the middle of the production day while payroll's running and not feel bad about it. How do we make that, you that comfortable that you will do that? Because some of our clients do every single day. You know what's actually worse than a patch upgrade or a binary version? A configuration change. There's a lot of companies and a lot of venture capital that's been poured into finding network problems and letting you be aware of network problems. And this is good stuff. I love that. But you know what? I spent years in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s being deathly afraid of a feature that Juniper Networks built. Configuration, commit, confirm. That's an awesome feature. I've depend I could have used that feature a few times in my life. It would have made my life better. If you don't know, you, you type a command. And if you don't confirm that command within like 30 to 60 seconds because you locked yourself out, 
or you crash the box, it rolls it back. That's an awesome feature. That was a great feature in the late 90s. Why did the switch let you type no router BGP in the middle of the production day on a core system? Can somebody answer me that? Are we smart enough to like be, you're typing something that's going to destroy this network and will disconnect you? How about the switch says, no, I won't open the pod bay doors, Dave. No, we can do better. Ken was telling me I needed to learn Golang. And Fred, coming up, told me I needed to use VS Code. So I loaded the Golang library into VS Code, and like an idiot, I started typing Python. And before I hit enter, it told me I had errors in that line of configuration. It didn't wait till I tried to compile it to tell me my code sucked. It told me before I even hit enter and move to the next line. Why can't we do that with networking? And then how do we take this culture of observability? How do we let you audit and monitor and know that all of these patches, remediations, new binaries, changes you've put out there actually worked to solve a problem? How can we take any port on a network and turn every port into a sniffer or a probe or a unified threat manager or an IDS? How do we make the provisioning and programming of that happen in software through the tools you use today and not introduce a six-step process with three different systems to get there?